Uh, our first short talk will be Reuse or Recycle Your Old Computer by Tom Worthington. And Tom is the author of the free ebook ICT Sustainability Assessment and Strategies for a Low Carbon Future. <laughs> Low Carbon Future. <laughs> and teaches an online course in ICT sustainability which starts at the Australian National University in, um, I guess already started, in mid-February. Okay, uh, Tom. and television sets piled up for recycling. Um, and I was thinking we could sort of build a skyscraper out of them um, at the moment. Um, anybody been along to one of these places recently? Um, across Australia now, you'll find things like this. In some ways, this is a good thing because they're not going into the landfill, being buried, all the materials leaching out affecting the environment. But in another way, it's a bit of a waste to find these things piled up. So um, the issue is that computers, mobile phones, all these gadgets become obsolete fairly quickly compared to old-fashioned things we had, like refrigerators designed to last about 10 years. Your computer might last a long time, but the consumer pressure on you is to replace it every 18 months with the new and improved model. Um, so I guess the main message is we all have to think about when we buy something, before we buy it, what are we going to do with it when it's finished uh, with and how will we be responsibly looking at it. I teach this stuff at the ANU in Canberra to computer science students, but um, the sort of things at a global level is Australia is signatory of what's called the, the Basel Convention um, on the control of hazardous waste and their disposal. So there are international laws about if you have toxic waste, you're not allowed to transport it across an international border without some form of certificate from the government. Uh, in Australia, there are laws on the export and import of used electronic equipment, computers, television sets, mobile phones, and it's assumed that any electronic equipment is hazardous until you can prove otherwise. And some of these laws also apply at a state level, so you can't transport bits of old computer across a state boundary usually without some form of permit. Um, so there are some laws around this sort of thing. Um, usually only concerns large companies, that sort of thing. Um, what's happened in the last couple of years is the federal government brought in the National Television and Computer Recycling Scheme. So what they do is large importers of computer gear have to pay a levy, which is used to pay the cost of setting up centres like the one in Canberra and uh, several in Sydney where members of the public can take their old computers and they're assured that these computers will be recycled. The stuff just won't go into landfill. So this is in operation and in, in effect is adding to the cost of all the computers that you buy and televisions. Um, but it's probably a good thing. Um, the latest report is that people have dropped off in the last year, 41,000 tonnes of computers and television sets under this system. Roughly a third of the number of new gadgets bought. Two thirds of them are still ending up who knows where. Plus, we've had this transition to digital TV, which means there's a whole lot of old television sets that people are replacing. And we've had the change to um, smart 
little tablet devices. So I suspect there are a large number of computers sitting in people's houses still yet to be put on the curb or something. But at least now you can go to um, either a council recycling centre and give it in there or some places like Officeworks, for example, where, you can, where you're buying new stuff, you can drop off your old stuff. Yes, um, well they're in, listed in, if you go to uh, the Recycling Drop-Off Points website, um, Officeworks are listed in there. So I think they're doing it. Um, they, they may not be telling people. But of course, I, I think they'd be delighted to take away your old computer as long as you buy a new one. Um, I think that's one of the issues. So. If you go to some of these websites, like one's doing mobiles, it's called Mobile Master. And if you go to the website, they guarantee they will recycle the computer, which is good. They're not just throwing it in a ditch. But in another way, it's bad because they guarantee that it will not be reused as, as a mobile phone. They guarantee it'll take it away to a factory, smashed up into bits, and the metal gets recycled, the plastic gets recycled. Um, because for them it's too hard to reuse it. Um, there are some schemes for reuse. So, for example, the Australian Computer Society in South Australia takes old computers, reformats the disk, reinstalls Microsoft Windows and a whole lot of software, and sells them at a low price to people who are on pensions and so forth. Interesting. Would you like to elaborate? No. <laughs> okay. They're not the they're not the only ones doing mobile phone recycling. If whenever I see one of these phone recycling things, I have a look in and see if there's anything good in there. <laughs> it's better than my phone. But I have never been game to pull anything out in case they say no, no, you're not allowed to do that. Um, because at least if the phone gets smashed up you can be fairly sure that the data on it, you know, because consumers throw away their computers and their mobile phones without thinking to erase anything. Um, all this gets a bit tricky. Ooh, the other one about charities. Charities. There's a number of them though that won't, that won't uh, say a narrative of um, reverse garbage. The Bowery. So the Bowery will use uh, electronic equipment and resell it because they will test it. They will test it, but some of the places like the Salvation Army, uh, even St Paul, which is one where I work, one of my, uh, where I live, neither of them will have any because they won't pay to have to test it and submit that for them to be tested. Yes, so the, there's an issue with mains powered equipment that if they're going to reuse it, sell it to someone else, they, it has to have it electrically checked, as well as the issue of ensuring any data has been erased. So it is a problem. Um, and there is the problem that the general public will expect a computer to come with Microsoft Windows. Therefore, the computer will have to be powerful enough for that. Um, there's technical things about e-waste. Um, the New Zealanders have done a lot of work on get a whole lot of plastic. How do you work out which is the old plastic which has nasty chemicals in it, bromated flame retardant chemicals, which needs special treatment and which isn't. Uh, but in general, the industry has sort of worked that out. Um, the bit that the general public hasn't worked out is if you're going to re reuse a computer, you better erase it first. <laughs> Depends on the <laughs> suburb. So the no lower North Shore erase their discs, or do you find a lot of interesting stuff on them? Maybe they, maybe they get their butler to. 
Uh, now, here in Sydney, there is TAD, Technical Aid to the Disabled, yes. and they will accept donations of old computers, which they then refurbish using retired computer engineers and reinstall new software, and they make sure they erase the disk, and then they sell them to people who are on disab disability pensions and things for a nominal amount. The catch is, because they're installing Microsoft Windows, it says on the website Windows 7, but I presume it'll be Windows 8 shortly. They can only take, they can't take computers around more than a few years old because they're not going to run the software. Uh, I heard just a minute ago um, a charity in East Timor putting Linux on computers to send over there, but we haven't heard how well that went. Um, Microsoft are ending XP support. Last year I was helping somebody clear up their house. They had seven old computers with Microsoft Windows 98 and Windows XP. And they said, oh, we're going to give this to a charity and they'll send them to East Timor, actually. And I thought, I do not want to inflict the, these computers on someone. <laughs> so I ended up putting Mint Linux version 15 Mate on them, figuring that was something that looked vaguely like Windows. Um, and um, one of the old ones was so old it didn't work. Um, one of them I couldn't get it to boot from the flash thing. I had to use a, a, a CD-ROM. One of them wouldn't boot from the CD-ROM. I had to use the flash thing. So you can understand the problems in you know, doing these sorts of things. Um, and then I did that and I just wrote a note on it saying that Windows was not, wasn't there. I left the Windows sticker on in case somebody could get a license upgrade. Um, Microsoft generally provide free copies of their software to the charities who uh, donate these computers. So to them, there isn't any sort of cost advantage in using um, Linux. Uh, but there is the advantage that you can get very old computers to still do something useful. And about the only th other thing, um, keep in mind that if a second-hand computer isn't e-waste, so if the computer actually works, it's not subject to all these controls. Um, so there may be benefit in business for that. Um, the other thing is uh, old computers use more electricity than new computers. So environmentally, there's a trade-off. You keep a very old computer running, it's going to be chewing up power, which is burning coal and polluting the environment in itself. So at some point, it's not worth using an old computer in environmental terms. Yeah, so if you need a, a PC to do some little task, then it might be better off getting a little modern gadget to do it than a large computer. Yeah. Particularly, there's the sort of the beer fridge syndrome where you buy a new fridge, instead of throwing away the old fridge, you put it in the shed and it, it's the beer fridge, it's running and using up lots of power. Don't get in the situation where this place where I went to where they had seven computers sitting there. Um, so you might be better off getting a new computer. Several of them of the computers were plugged in and running simultaneously. Um, yes. Um, that's that's about all I um, all I had to say. Um, the issue of turning off your computer, I heard the news that scientists in Tasmania want people to install a little thing that will do uh, climate change calculations using spare CPU cycles and display the results on your screensaver. To me, that's a bad idea. <laughs> it would be better for the planet if you got consumers to turn their computer off and turn the screen off. 
<laughs> yeah. So maybe, maybe we need a different screen set. But um, so to some extent. Which was the bad suburb? The ones who didn't erase their data. I have been thinking next time I need a, a new computer, I'll just put a sign out the front saying computer recycling service. <laughs> Minimum standard of, of, uh, of pr uh, accepted is the following. And there was one last question. Um, the... Uh, Yeah, and also. And and also the monitor as well. The CRT monitors, the glass screens, use a lot more power, and the newer L liquid crystal screens use less power because they have LED backlight than the older ones, right. as well. And there are standards um, which are originally from the US for the energy efficiency of computers. They keep raising the energy efficiency level so, and the companies want to get their rating so they can sell them to government agencies and large suppliers generally. Yeah. We out of time? Uh, not really. Oh, right. Okay. Well, let's take, take, take in questions. Oh, one more question. Well, it, it, there's, there's a, tr there's a trade-off. I'm just trying to remember, I think, about 40% of the energy in a desktop computer is in the original manufacturer. The other 60% is the running power to run it. Um, but if you've got a very old computer, suppose you need a little sort of web server thing, which nowadays can run using a, you know, a processor in a mobile phone, but instead you use an old desktop computer that's this big and uses 60 watts or something, and the new one uses half a watt. Um, that's you, you're probably going to save enough energy in the lifetime of the un, new one compared to the old equipment where you can recycle the metal and the plastic, and that sort of thing.
but think about it. Um, Mm. And if you're in a company and they say, we have this great scheme, we recycle our old computers by flying them to a third world country, then they're probably doing something that's good for PR, but not terribly good for the planet or the people at the other end. Um, or for the people at this end. Or for the people <laughs> at this end. Um, so uh, just keep in mind that the, the recycling schemes are up and going and... Um, collecting a fair bit of equipment at the moment. Who knows, maybe we need a charity that installs Linux on. I've seen some ads on TVS for it, which had a very fancy office come in and get a computer. And I thought, hmm. Very corporate, it looks. <laughs> but um, yeah, but I think we'll leave it at that point. There's stuff online about all this. Oh. What sort of things are associated with power recycling? Power you mentioned computers, TVs, mobiles. Can you give the rest of those Okay, the, t the national TV and whatever it's called scheme. Um, national television computer recycling scheme covers desktop computers, laptops printers are the peripherals, television sets. It doesn't cover mobile phones. It doesn't cover other appliances around the place. But you just pull your car up. In the one in Canberra, you pull your car up, open the boot, chuck the stuff in. Uh, you chuck computers in one place and all peripherals and TVs in another so they can count them. Uh, it doesn't cover mobile phones, but there are a number of schemes like the mobile muster for mobile no, mobile. Well, they're, they're generally at other places. So the CRT screens are one of the things that are recycled in Australia. So they're sent to South Australia and the, the glass is melted down and reused. Most of the other components are just packed into shipping containers and sent somewhere else where we're all assured that it's all done properly. It isn't urchins picking them apart with their teeth or whatever. Um, so under the scheme, uh, the companies doing the work have to guarantee that they're doing it within international standards. Hopefully some will audit them at some time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's put our hands together for Tom. <laughs> and I'll return control. And um, yeah, we'll have a short break while Robert sets up his um, his slides and everything. Um, I don't know if there's any more pizza. I have a feeling it's all run out. So there's still water.
Mm. I'm live already, am I? Yes. Coming? Yep, keep Come stand here. As a test or to start the talk? Uh, talking, testing one, two, three. All right? Yeah, I suppose so. Let's start. Actually, give me one second. I'll just quickly move off to the top. I'll, our uh, second and final short talk today uh, will be Subuser with Docker by Robert Smith. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, a couple months ago, I gave a short talk on Docker, which is... Uh, it's like uh, Linux containers for software delivery. So it's sort of like uh, you can package your, <coughs> your software up to be a container and isolate it from the rest of the operating system. So today I'm just going to give a talk on what's been updated in Docker and a little bit on uh, Subuser, which is a tool that uses Docker to, uh, to do some extra little things. So. First of all, last time on Docker, uh, we were talking about uh, it's a universal delivery for Linux containers. So the Linux containers are isolated, so the processes there don't affect anything on the operating system. Uh, it also means that you don't have to worry about whether your, contain your software that you're delivering is for Red Hat or Debian or SUSE. If it runs in a container, it'll run on any of them in a container. Uh, likewise, the file system is isolated, so it's a copy on write mounts. So any changes that you make are historically recorded and you can commit them or discard them or whatever. <coughs> it's, and it also has a repository system, so the repository system is sort of like uh, Git for binaries, if you like. So you can just do docker pull this and it'll go and grab it and any other uh, containers that it's based on will also be pulled in. Uh, so since then, Docker is now providing, uh, approaching its uh, 1.0 release. Uh, this is what Red Hat is going to be supporting in uh, Red Hat 7. So Red Hat 7 is already committed to having that support, full support for Docker 1. Uh, with Docker 1, they're also going to release the official uh, Docker books and documentation 
Uh, Red Hat have already written a certification for it, so if your software is certified to run with Docker, it'll you know it's going to work on any Linux to show pretty much. Um, some of the new features they've added, they're now basing the images off uh, BTRFS uh, instead of, and as an option instead of AUFS. Not all Linux's, Linux kernels built, are built to support AUFS, so this is a big part in making it more universal. Um, they've also added support to OSX, so if the Docker image runs, if your software delivered by a Docker image runs in Linux, it'll run in OSX as well. Uh, and they've done a, uh, a VM image called Boot to Docker. It's a 25 megabyte Linux distro. That's pretty much just a CD ISO image. And you boot your VM off that, it'll automatically mount another hard drive if you've got one configured onto your VM. And all the software and Docker images will be stored in the hard drive and you don't have to worry about setting up a Linux box anymore. Um, they've also split up the, the whole thing up into different drivers. So it used to be dependent on L, uh, LXC, uh, which is the Linux containers. Uh, actually, it's so Linux containers use what's a feature built into the kernel called uh, namespaces where they divide the namespace of the kernel. So a process can be set into a separate namespace and therefore it can't see processes or memory or hard disk space or network or whatever that it belongs to a different namespace. And the tool that was being used to do all that to take advantage of that feature was LXC. Uh, so the new version of Docker is no longer dependent on LXC. It has its own uh, libraries that are able to talk directly to the, to the kernel and set up the namespaces. Uh, and they've actually named that libcontainer. Uh, and you, so you don't have the dependency on LXE anymore. And they hope that other people might use libcontainer for their other projects. And so remove the dependency on some other tool. Um, the other thing they've done, they've also done some more work on the uh, API. So you can control the Docker images and start, stop the Docker images from another API, from another uh, tool. Uh, so subuser. So subuser. Why do you need subuser? So first of all, subuser has the advantage. One of the good use cases is that you have an untrusted application. You don't really know where it came from. You're not sure what it's going to do. Subuser could help you isolate that with a doc by placing it in the Docker image. Uh, or alternatively, you have a doc, uh, you have a trusted application, but it might be subject to exploit. Say, for instance, running Firefox, someone tries to hack into your computer. You want to limit how much damage they can do if they get in. Uh, so the tools we have today uh, to protect, isolate applications and protect, uh, limit the damage a hack on one application can do to the rest of your system, uh, pretty much. SE Linux and AppArmor. Uh, but these are more divine, designed to be at a system level, uh, not at a user level. So they usually got, uh, <coughs> they're usually running on a dedicated app rather than, you know, uh, individual person running their own uh, word processor or a browser or something like that. Uh, they're difficult to configure and the config configuration is usually delivered as part of that app, not something that you, uh, your normal user can uh, fiddle with. Um, the other tool that people generally use to protect uh, for these sorts of things is your user limitations. If you're logged in as user A, you can't touch stuff that is belonging to user B. But this doesn't help uh, because there are other Oops, I missed a slide. Did I? No. It, these don't usually help when you're trying to do your day-to-day -day tasks. None of those tools are going to protect you, protect your documents if your Firefox gets hacked and someone starts, you know, overwriting your documents directory. So this is what subuser is for. It runs each app 
in, an, in, a, in its own Docker image. Uh, you can map into that Docker image what directories it, you want that application to have access to. So for instance, if you're running Firefox, you might decide, okay, Firefox ha should have access to the downloads directory, but there's no need for it to have access to my documents directory or my settings or something like that. Um, it's also, in s the app is installed from a Docker repo, or you can build it yourself. Uh, and its only requirements is pretty much Docker and Python. All right, so to install Docker is pretty much just uh, go to that website. It's the, most Linux distros these days will have a Docker image. Uh, so you can probably just pull it straight from the, your distros repositories. But I, before it was easy to do that, I put it on my own system. It doesn't require very much. It doesn't have very many dependencies. You pretty much just put the binary on there and it goes. Um, so subuser, to install subuser, it's pretty much just a, a git clone and of the subuser uh, tool. Uh, and then just add the uh, path to the binary at the start of your path so as it will find the subuser programs before it finds your regular programs. Obviously, if you want to run, launch Firefox, for example, you wanted to launch Firefox from subuser, not the main Firefox. Um, so to install to install apps that are there that are already configured and available in subuser, it's pretty much just subuser install Firefox. So you don't have to do very much at all. You pretty much just do that. And it'll, it has, uh, when you install subuser, it has a list of uh, stuff that is available. And it just finds the config file on that list. And part of that config file is a Docker build file, which pretty much just goes, grabs Firefox, puts in the system, makes a new image of it, and runs it. Uh, so those, emit, those uh, config files sit in here, subuser programs that can be installed, very self-explanatory, uh, and just pulls the Docker image in. The permissions as to what this image is going to have access to uh, is pretty much just the permissions.json file in that same folder. Uh, and it pretty much just, it's a j simple JSON file. It just says, you know, access to this directory, uh, access, not access to anything else. By default, it doesn't give you access, give the package access to anything other than what you specify. Um, if you wanted to create one yourself, uh, it's not too difficult either. It's just pretty much make a directory. Uh, so your executable name, uh, go into that directory, create the Docker image, um, and edit the permissions file, which they define here. Um, the, the Docker image itself, uh, it's just a simple Docker, uh, Docker file, which is, uh, if I go here, is that good? So Docker files are not too complicated. They're pretty much just a, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, that'd probably be a good place to start, yes. Is it loading? So let's try, I don't know. So when you see a tick in the Docker repository, it means that it's a verified build, which means that it's actually the Docker servers that builds the package, and it builds the package according to this Docker file, uh, which is listed here. So when you see a tick in a 
Docker image, you know that it was built with this because it was actually built by the Docker uh, service. And you know, you know someone hasn't touched it or done anything since then. So that's your simple Docker file, and it pretty much just says, this is my starting image. So in this case, it's starting from a standard Ubuntu uh, image. And from that Ubuntu image, it pretty much just says, install this software, install that software, uh, run this command, run that command, and install Oracle. And then this sets the default command for when this uh, image is run. And, yep. Yes. Well, what this is doing, so this one is, so what it does, you type in the Docker command, Docker pull this uh, image, this, so Docker pull Docker file slash Java, and it, it'll pull the, this image that, that they built here, all right? And that image was built from this Ubuntu image. Somewhere deeper down, someone's built an image from scratch and not based it off something else, okay? So that image is, so this is built from the Docker file Ubuntu, Docker file slash Ubuntu image. So it takes that, that's a starting base. It's a copy on write system. So from that starting base, it runs these commands. All right? It runs these commands, and those changes are recorded. Then they've gone and said, okay, now with my end result, I commit that and make a new image. So when you say, I'm going to pull in this new image, it'll first grab this if you don't already have it. Maybe you have it for some other image you were running, or maybe you pulled it for something else in which case it only, it only downloads the changes, the differences. But if, it, if you don't have it, it will download the first image and then the, any, the image that's based off that and the image that's based off that until it finally gets to the image that you're actually trying to run. Uh, that's what I was saying. It was sort of like a Git for binaries in that it, each image records only the differences from the image that it was based on. And then it takes all that and it runs it within a container. So running it within a container means that you don't ha it doesn't have access to anything by default. It doesn't have access to anything of your, your main operating system. It only sees this, uh, this virtual file system that's been built up of all these images stacked on top of each other. You could then decide, okay, I want to map this particular directory into my Docker image or whatever. Uh, likewise, the network, the network as far as the processes within, within the container are concerned, they think they're running on a separate machine. They don't know any better. The only thing that's common between the Docker image uh, and the, your main operating system is the Linux kernel. And that's why it's sort, of like a, it's sort of like a virtualization without the overhead of virtualization because everything's isolated from each other. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a competitor because it's basically OpenVZ, OpenVZ and LXC, they're doing the, ISO, the uh, network container stuff. What Docker is doing is a standard way of delivering a software via a network container. So the idea is that you package your software into a Docker container and you don't care what distro it's running on. You just deliver it as a Docker image and all I have to do then is go docker pull my software and you'll have a running image. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to pull it down first. You can just do docker run my image and it'll realize, oh, I don't have it already. Pull it down, run it. It's that simple. And I've done it a dozen times. It doesn't take very much. It works very well. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, you can, you can. Uh, so, I mean, can you install multiple uh, containers at once? Yes, certainly you can. Each container is isolated from each other. So you can have 
I've had three different containers running on the same machine and I've linked them to, because one of the other features that Docker provides is a way of linking their containers together. So say for instance I've got a Docker image with uh, a, a MySQL and I've got a Docker image with Tomcat, Java and some app. I can link them together. So as, as far as SQL is concerning, concern, as far as that, that uh, database is concerned running within the container, it's running on a standard SQL port but that's not visible to the host machine. Then on this container I just say, okay, for this port I'm linking these two together. So these two are linked together as if they can talk on the network at the standard SQL port, a standard MySQL port, but nothing outside those two containers can see or touch that MySQL port. It's isolated. Yep. Uh, yes, but in Docker it would be probably more of a manual process. Docker is really aimed at a server side of things, but this sub-user is pretty much taking that same tool, that same built, uh, same tool, and using it for a end-user perspective. So using the sub-user, you have a more easy control over that. You can say for sub-user, I want access to the my fire, I want my Firefox GUI to have access to uh, the downloads directory, but not any others. And Docker will, and you're also told uh, sub-user that I want this application to have access to my X windows, you know, and the sub, uh, sub-user will take care of that connectivity. But you can do the same thing in Docker, but it's more of a manual process because it's, it's more, Docker's more designed for a service perspective, a service side perspective where you probably want to control that yourself. Uh, and Docker also has APIs, so you can have some other tool controlling it uh, so there's actually a program called Shipyard, which is in itself delivered as a Docker image uh, and just runs a web, web page that allows you to control the starting, stopping and connectivity of the other Docker images on that same machine. I think that's uh, one more. It requires uh, containerized capabilities, but there are other uh, Unix-based systems that also provide containerized capabilities. So as I understand it, and I don't think they've done too much of this, and I haven't really looked up how, how they do the OS X, but they did say that they're delivering it now on OS X. Uh, I didn't have a Mac to try this out on, so I didn't really look too deeply into it. Uh, but say for instance you've got BSD, BSD has an equivalent type uh, functionality and they call it jails. The idea is that Docker is going to have a driver that knows how to deal with jails and will do the Docker image within a jails container and it'll also have a driver for doing a container within a, a Linux container or Linux namespaces type arrangement. I, I don't know if they're going that far, but I wouldn't be surprised. You certainly you certainly can run Ubuntu container, uh, or Ubuntu Docker image under Red Hat or SUSE, and as far as the programs running under that container are concerned, they're running on Ubuntu. Okay, we'll have to wrap it up uh, for tonight and. Um, I guess any further questions or other discussion, we'll have to take um, to the pub. To the pub! Um, and yeah, please uh, please remember that the April meeting is in... Um, the second. Is in May, the second of... Uh, Friday the 2nd of um, May. Okay. Um, um, I do plan yeah. to give another talk on Docker when they release the 1.0 and I've had a chance to play with okay, it. Okay, um, let's thank Robert for... A taste of the talk to come.